Welcome back, friends, to this episode of Weekly Devotions on the Parables, sponsored by the Anglican Orthodox Communion Worldwide. My name is Jerry Ogles, and I'm a minister in the Anglican Orthodox Communion. Tonight we're going to be discussing the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, before we begin the parable study, however, I would like to make a couple of points. First of all, the nature of a parable. A parable is a story that illustrates some practical, observable event in common life, but it has a higher spiritual application for us to learn. Uh, in the case of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, there are theologians who believe that this is an actual event that our Lord, that our Lord is, is uh, enumerating to us. However, I do believe it is a parable. Even though it's a parable, I believe that the exact same things that are related in this parable were common in Jerusalem and the vicinity thereabout in the days of Christ. In order to understand it a little better, we need to have an understanding of the context in which it is given. Jesus has been talking in this chapter about stewardship, and he talks about covetousness, and the scribes and Pharisees are standing by trying to catch him on any, any small error, the smallest error they can find uh, in his speech. And so we start then to read from the 14th verse of the uh, previous verses to this, to this parable. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. That is the context for what this is given. And so Jesus gives this parable to reveal to the scribes and Pharisees and the other doubters the evil of what they are thinking and the way that they view things in this life. Now, I hope you have your Bible with you, and we'll read together beginning at the 19th verse of this same chapter uh, 16 of the Gospel of St. Luke, beginning at 19. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain uh, beggar, named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dog came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Uh, the rich man also died, and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, <clears throat> and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may 
testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now this is a very profound uh, parable. It opens our eyes to some very glorious things and also some very hideous and scary things. First of all, these two men lived in close proximity. I mean, spent their days in close proximity. One man laying outside the gate. He was not ambulatory. He could not move. He was helpless. He was sick. He was hungry. He was tired. He was old. And the rich man just... A few steps away lived in a sumptuous uh, fair, lived lavishly. And I'm sure the, the, the beggar could smell the, 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 um, the, the, the beautiful flavor of the food that uh, was being prepared in the sumptuous meals that the rich man ate. And it made him even more uh, suffering of hunger because he could smell, but he could not taste. The rich man, uh, there's no record that he ever gave anything to the beggar, but it probably is likely that some of the guests that came, who were also well-to-do, probably shared something with the beggar to keep him at least alive. So we're told here, though, that the rich man died and was buried. And Lazarus died also and was given an escort by the angels to Abraham's bosom. I want you to look at the difference in the estate of these two men. One man who loved the world, who loved the things of the world, inherited something of the world, which was a grave. And the poor man, who had no hope whatsoever in this life, was escorted by the angels to heaven. The President of the United States or of any other country never received such an entourage as that, as to be escorted by angels into the presence of Abraham, into paradise. Okay. Uh, we say in hell, the rich man opened his eyes and he was in hell. You know, some people do not believe in hell. There is a hell. There is a living hell, and it is a complete and total separation from God. If we want to be separate from God, from God and we live as if God does not exist in this life, then we already have a taste of hell in this life, but we're going to have a much better taste of it in later life if we don't, uh, if we don't listen to the word of the Lord and repent and follow him. So the rich man woke up in hell, and he was thirsty. He had a burning thirst, and his tongue was just dry and swollen. And he saw Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. And he said, Father Abraham said, send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and just touch my, my tongue because I'm, I'm tormented in this flame. Hell is a burning flame. And so Abraham told him, said, no, said, he cannot come to you because there's a great gulf fixed between heaven and hell so that no one can go from heaven to hell or from hell back to heaven. The same thing applies to the fact that nobody can go from here to heaven and come back again. In spite of all of those cheap little books that you buy about someone going to heaven for 90 minutes and then coming back, or going to hell for 90 minutes and coming back. If you go, you'll never come back. If you go to heaven, why would you want to come back? If you go to hell, you couldn't come back. So don't waste your money on those deceitful books. Okay. Uh, Abraham said, you know, said, in his life, Lazarus suffered evil things 
but you suffered sumptuously. Now you are the beggar. Now you are the one that are that is begging for Abra uh, for uh, Lazarus to come and dip his finger in water and touch your tongue. You're the beggar now, and Lazarus is the rich man. Really, that's what, that's what it, that's the way it is. And so, the the rich man said, "Well, send Lazarus to my father's house, cause I have five brothers, and let Lazarus preach to them, so that they will not come to this place." of torment. And Abraham said, if they do not believe the law and the prophets, they will not believe one who come back from the dead. The Jews knew the law and the prophets, but they didn't really believe it. It was a way of making a living for them by bearing rule over the people, by making money, but they didn't really believe what the prophets had said. As a matter of fact, they killed a lot of the prophets. They didn't obey the law. And so if they won't listen to the law, if they don't learn from the law and the prophets, they won't learn if one comes back from the dead. Jesus came back from the dead, and they still, the majority of the Jewish nation, did not believe him. They did not regard him as their Lord and Savior. Now, they knew. By the way, it is my firm belief that the scribes, <clears throat> excuse me, the scribes and Pharisees knew who Jesus was. But they could not accept the threat to their livelihood, to their quality of life. And so they rejected him. <coughs> if they hear not Moses and the prophets, Abraham said, neither will they be persuaded the one come from the dead. Now I'll tell you something, one did come from the dead and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The people before Christ, the, the descendants of Abraham, only those who believed the promise that was made to Abraham were true Israel. Those people had to have a lot of faith <coughs> to believe in the coming Christ because it was not an accomplished event, it was a promise. It was a promise made to them, made to Abraham, and made by the prophets, and even the law. And they had to believe based on that. Now we have an advantage over those people because we can look back on the actual event, the actual life, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't require as much faith for us to believe as it did for them. So why don't we act like we believe? We pay lip service. Many Christians pay lip service to Christ. Oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. And then they go out and live any way they want to. Faith requires a change of heart. Love requires compassion. We are compelled to love others and to return our that love to God as well that he has showered upon us. Have we done that? This simple parable points us in the right way. This simple parable tells us that there is a difference between the destiny of those who are godless and those who are people of faith. It tells us that we will not inherit a grave because our grave will only be a borrowed tomb, just as Jesus' grave was a borrowed tomb. But they inherit the ground, the earth, the dirt, and hell itself. There's a big difference. So let us be aware of that difference. Let us put feet on our prayers and on our faith. Let us put it into action because action is proof of faith also. We are saved by grace, but we are also saved unto good works. Works will not save us, but certainly after our salvation, works is evidence of our salvation. If you were to be tried today for being a Christian, what evidence could you present? I hope this has been a benefit to you. God bless you. See you next week. Goodbye.